over there. Um, we're going to get started with our panel discussion. This is a reminder to those of you with handheld mics that you need to put it like basically almost on your mouth so that people can hear you. Um, and the Reverend Lorbeth Buckleiter is going to be our moderator of this uh, panel. But I just want to first say I am so deeply grateful to all of you for saying yes to doing this. I was, um, you're all the people I asked and you all said yes. And so <laughs> that doesn't happen very often um, when you're in church and asking people to risk and to tell your stories. So I'm just so deeply grateful and honored. And so thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody who's online. And uh, Reverend Lorbeck, take it away. Thank you. And I will echo what Jen says. Thank you all for being here. Our stories are sacred. And they are personal. Um, they are part of who we are. They are part of what creates and defines us. Um, and even if there was nobody else out here, the storytelling, the reflections that we have up here would be valuable to each other, to ourselves. However, the fact that you all are here makes those stories even more precious and more valuable. It makes those narratives even more powerful. And so thank you for sticking around. Thank you for making the time and giving our voices some space. Um, so I'm going to um, present our first question. We have a, f a few questions that we've um, given to them in advance that we're going to talk through. I'm going to ask you to answer that question and to introduce yourself as you do um, in whatever way you want to do that with as little or as much detail um, as you'd like. And after we go through these three questions, um, I'm, I am going to open it up. Um, to you all uh, for some questions. Um, I will field to those questions first, and if you all are comfortable, you may pipe up and, and speak in there, but um, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot that, other than me, um, uh, I went to seminary to learn to be on the spot, so I have to, I have to do that now. So. <laughs> Good, so our first question um, is how, how did faith communities impact your coming out? That was our first question, right? Yeah, okay. I wrote these questions and I forget the order already. It's been a long morning already. How did faith communities impact the process of you coming out? And I invite you to interpret, interpret that any, any way you want to. How did it impact you being closeted? How did it impact um, your fears? How did it affirm you? Um, whatever that experience might um, have brought up with you. Um, and I'm going to invite anyone who feels comfortable to anyone feel like going first. Sure, I'll start. Um, okay. I'm Rain. I go by they, them. Um, it, faith didn't really have a role in, like, when I realized that I was uh, trans, but it did sort of have a bit of a role in, like, me being closeted because a lot of my dad's side of the family especially is very, they're, they're, they're a, a bit more religious than my mom's side of the family is. Um, they're all Mexican. They're, it's very Catholic and Christian centered over there. And just like dealing with in the past, like dealing with um, Christian communities is sort of a mixed bag when it comes to LGBTQ plus um, topics. And so I was unsure of how they would respond should I come out. And like right, right when I was realizing that I might not be cis het was like when we were in Mexico for my 15th, my quinceanera. Um, and that is where I first came out to everyone. And fortunately it was received very well. Like they were all extremely accepting. And for that I'm really thankful. Very good. Uh, two things that, that, that popped out of that. One is unsure. And dealing with faith communities, uncertainty is our norm from the LGBTQ community. We never know what we're going to get. It's worse than a box of chocolates, trust me. <laughs> um, and also you used the, the term cis het. Would you mind expanding on what that is for? Uh, yeah, cis het is just a combination of the two words cisgender, which is just 
identifying as the gender that you were assigned at birth, and then heterosexual, which is just being straight. Thank you. Michelle, you want to go next? Um, for most of my life, my religious community uh, basically kept me in the closet. I, I grew up and lived the first half of my life almost exclusively within an evangelical conservative uh, uh, church environment. Well, I'm, I'm kind of old, you know, so I grew up... I, I don't believe that. <laughs> I grew up in the 50s and 60s, so the idea of trans didn't even exist back in those days. So I took my cues from the way the church treated gay and lesbian folks, especially gay folk. And from, from watching what the church did to those people, I realized that, number one, uh, I was regarded or if I ever came out, I would be regarded as defective. But not just defective, actually less than human. And secondly, I was very much led to believe that I was beyond the reach of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Those two things had tremendous impact on me for the vast majority of my life. Um, it wasn't until I was in my mid-50s I remember the moment very well. Uh, my wife and I were living in Fairbanks, Alaska. I think it was uh, sort of early spring. And I remember waking up one morning at 4 o'clock in the morning with the astonishing idea that it might be possible that God didn't hate me mm -hmm. just because I was trans. And after that, that sort of little epiphany, it took me years to rework my private theology to the point where I could be comfortable with myself as trans and as a child of God worthy of his grace. Amen. That's powerful and an experience that I think I hear common among trans people is that our perception of God as handed to us by the church is exactly opposite of who God is, as we talked about in the sermon this morning. We are conditioned to believe that God hates us. We're conditioned to believe that we are unlovable by God. And that's not true just of the trans community. It's not true even just of the LGBTQ community. It's true of anyone who doesn't live up to and conform to the standards of whatever faith community they're in. The default of God is not that of a loving God but of a vengeful, hateful, expectant God. Um, I'm not giving out awards, but if I were giving out awards, you would win the most coordinated today because your mask and your dress match impeccably. And <laughs> thank you. I, okay, all right, yeah. Well, you know, a little competition never hurt anybody. I'm all good with it. <laughs> My name is Reverend Lewis Mitchell. I use he, him pronouns. I am currently serving as the bridge pastor at Alki United Church of Christ right down the road in West Seattle. And I, um, it's interesting, the question had two parts for me. The part that my faith played in my coming out as trans is that I was fortunate enough to have a pastor to whom I could speak about how to tell my family. Like I wasn't mm -hmm. really worried about, I had already come out a time or two around orientation um, and I was in a church that was fully accepting of all parts of all of us. And so I was very, very fortunate. And I went to her and I said, I'm scared to tell my mommy. Because my mom is, um, I'll call her slightly right of center in terms of her theology. Um, and I'm an only child and I did not want to lose my mama mm -hmm. in terms of affection. And my pastor said to me, she said, She's ready, just tell the truth. Oh. And I said, well, I won't tell you what I said because we're in a church. But I said something <laughs> that was a, a, an expletive of disbelief. But I also trusted her a great deal. And so I wrote my mom a letter. And my mom, uh, this is a bit of a long story, but I just got done preaching, so I'm still kind of on fire a little bit. Um, my mom wrote me a letter back, and she said... 
I may never understand or accept your life choices, but I respect your right to make them, and I will always love you. And really, that was all I wanted. I didn't expect her to understand. I didn't even want her acceptance. I didn't want to lose her love. Mm. So 20 plus years later, my mama gets super excited anytime I come home. She's on the phone and online. My son is coming home to spend some time with me. She came to my ordination. She prayed over me. And really, honestly, our relationship, like much of faith journeys, is completely impossible. Never could have happened on paper. Never going to happen in a made-for-TV movie. This older black woman raised in the southern black evangelical church loves her child and calls me by my name and calls me her son. And her witness, I believe, changed her pastor's life, who is now encouraging his congregation to be more open and accepting of LGBTQ plus people because he says... You cannot embrace and disgrace with the same arms. Amen. And so, I mean, it just, I feel like, you know, the lottery of kind of coming out stories because I didn't imagine that at all. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for that. I had, a, I had a similar conversation with my parents where they, they said, we don't understand it. I tried to explain gender dysphoria and the conversion therapy that I'd been in for 10 years. And, um, and my mom's response was, we don't, we don't understand it, but we knew some changes were coming. I'm, I was just a little afraid you were going to tell us you were a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> there were obviously a lot more long conversations to be had <laughs> later. But um, thank you for that. Yeah, that's powerful. And uh, for the record, uh, the award you get is by far for the best beard. So. The, uh, I always, and I'm sitting on these panels, and especially I love having trans men. I think it's a voice that isn't as well represented, represented in a lot of these communities. And I also have to um, throw a little shade because it's so much easier to grow a beard than it is to get rid of one <laughs> as, a, as a trans person. So. True story. True yeah. story. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Ara. I use uh, she and her pronouns. Uh, so I was uh, thinking about this a little bit. Um, I also grew up in a pretty conservative, evangelical sort of church context. Um, and I remember when I was, when I was pretty little, uh, elementary school sometime, my family had this like, TV preacher on and he said, when you, when you pray to God and ask for forgiveness for your sins, you, you need to name those sins specifically. Hmm. And uh, l later from that, I was, I was playing in my bedroom, and I had this little space shuttle toy. And I sat my, my little chair down on its back, and I sat in the chair. And I pretended I was Sally Ride in the hmm. space shuttle. Hmm. And I remember after that, I was like, oh, no, I... I need to pray about this because this is bad. Uh, and that, like, that mindset stuck with me for a really long time and kept me from coming out for a long time. And I think, like, even when, even when I did come out, it was like I kind of had to sort of bargain with God over it. Like, I had to find this way of interpreting, like, these texts that I always knew and be like, okay, well, maybe there's some space for me in here. And I, mean, I have a very different disposition from that now. I think like any way of being in the world that's centered around love doesn't need to be justified. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that, was, that really <laughs> stopped me from coming out for a long time. And I think like I look, look back on that and I have some admiration for myself there because it was like I was willing to risk God's condemnation to be authentic Amen. And like, yeah. when I was authentic I found that there was no condemnation right? hmm. that's beautiful um, first of all let me affirm the admiration for yourself um, that's not always an easy thing for us to come by 
um, in our community and something that should be honored and celebrated um, when it does. Um, the other thing that I heard in, from, from the TV preacher and your reaction to it is how often we are encouraged to fix things that aren't truly broken. And, and while that in and of itself is damaging enough, what so often happens is that we're so focused on fixing things that aren't actually broken that we aren't fixing things that are. Um, we're so focused on not being trans, not being gay, that we're not dealing with traumas from our life. We're not healing from other hurts and other struggles um, that we've come up against. And so um, it's a distraction from true healthy spiritual growth and so um thank you and by the way the, the award that you're going to get is for the most awesome hair because that i'm not even in that race I, I, well i'm yeah yeah owning baldness is a whole nother level though I didn't so have a choice. I didn't okay my friend said the hair was going to leave my head and move to my shoulders okay <laughs> good um a total side note i have a my my middle child is my daughter who came out as trans over the summer. Um, whole other story if you ever want to talk about it sometime, but Isa um, has hair that, that reminds me a lot of, of yours and it's, it's full and amazing. So, um, our, our next question, and Michelle will you read it just so that I have the right wording? How has being trans affected your interactions with faith communities? Yeah, so um, how has our experience, how has your experience as a trans person affected the way you show up at church um, is one way to ask that question. And I'm going to add a, a layer to that. Um, as several of you mentioned, um, well, you all offered your pronouns, which I really appreciate, and mentioned uh, your mom using your name and the right pronouns. And I remember the first time I heard my parents um, use my name. For my dad, that was the first time. He, he was much more comfortable using my name, Laura Beth, when he was praying for me than he was when he was talking to other people in the church. And he was the finally, one that finally picked up on that and said, okay, if God is okay with this, I think these old men at the church can, can come around to it. So hearing our names, hearing our pronouns um, from people it's a simple thing and a very basic thing, but I think something that's often overlooked in values. So, um, so as you talk about engaging faith communities, I'd like to invite you to also just answer how important that is and maybe even share some of your first moments of, of that. And by the way, you win for the best hat, because <laughs> hands down. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, just, I mean, I've been fortunate enough that most of the faith communities that my family interacts with are generally very accepting. I went to, um, earlier in my childhood, I went to Alki. I've been to um, the St. Matthew's, which is like right down the road from my old middle school. I've been to um, Prince of Peace a couple times, which generally a little less like understanding of what LGBTQ is, but generally very accepting. And then of course here, which is the most accepting church I've ever witnessed. Um, in my St. Life. Matthews and Prince of Peace, what were those associated with? Um, Prince of Peace is a Lutheran church. I do not remember what St. Matthews St. is. Matthews Mom, do you remember? Like a... It's also, also a Lutheran, a Lutheran church. church yeah. But um, generally, I try, like, whenever I'm presenting myself to those kind of communities, it's more in just, like, a physical way that I interact with most of my peers, which is perceive me as my mm. gender and... I'm always dressing up like this, but I generally, I just feel very safe around these kinds of communities because they're just very accepting. I'm not sure how I would present myself to like those that aren't or if I even <clears throat> would. Thank you. Yeah, something important to note there and something we have to pay attention to a lot. Um, just because a church is a Lutheran church doesn't mean it's an accepting and affirming church. Um, there are different brands of Lutheran, just as there are different brands of Presbyterian. Um, believe it or not, just because a church is a UCC church doesn't mean that it's an accepting and affirming church. And so we have to learn how to vet the faith communities that we're going to engage with so that we, we do have that experience. Um, 
you know, and that's, that's not something that most LGBTQ people are truly equipped to do, and as a result, they stay home. Um, or they find their spiritual community in a gay bar on Saturday night. Um, and honestly, there's, there may not be anything wrong with that if that's truly the safe place that they can find community that's going to nurture and love them. So, um, so thank you for, and thank you, Mom, for um, clarifying that. That's an important thing for us to have to work through. So, Michelle. The sense of being uh, defective or other or was incredibly alienating for me. Um, that alienation led to a really profound distrust and even a rather cynical attitude towards all organized religion. And uh, finally, uh, in my mid to late 30s, I actually became unchurched for several years. It was uh, only through my participation in church music that I found my way back to church mm -hmm. First, the church of my childhood, Green Lake Avenue Church, just a little north of here, and then a few years later, here at uh, here at Plymouth. Um, eventually, I was on the board, uh, church board at Green Lake Avenue, and a lesbian trans couple asked for membership, and that led to an extraordinary sequence of events which led to them being rejected as members of the church. And that in turn led me to find safety, seek safety here at Plymouth. So it was actually at Plymouth where I learned that uh, church communities could be accepting, um, supportive, and safe. And so that is how it is that I came to transition here several years ago. I actually lived this odd life in which I would go to my Adventist church on Sabbath morning, dressed as a boy and sing in the choir and otherwise participate. And then I would come here on Sunday morning as Michelle mm. and do the same things all over again. And it was really odd for Dr. Wanda Griffiths, as she is the music director at both churches. <laughs> <laughs> and that went on for two years. And finally, um, in the summer of 2018, I wrote a letter to my, my choir at the Adventist Church and said, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I transitioned there finally. I must say to their credit, despite their previous experience with a couple I mentioned earlier, I had an absolutely smooth transition there, just like I did here. So I was extraordinarily grateful for that, and uh, I'm really happy to be once again grounded in a faith community. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, the, the dual living, I think, is something that um, most of us experience for at least a season, if not a long, significant portions of our lives. Um, and if it sounds exhausting, it's because it is. Um, being two people, keeping track of who you are and where, keeping track of what people expect of you in certain places and living up to those expectations um, is so much harder than just genuinely being you and letting their expectations mold to that place. I'm very grateful that you found this place. And Thank God for you, Plymouth. Amen. Thank God for you being who you are. Um, before I answer that question, it's kind of strange being back in this room. Like, I haven't been in here in two years. And it seems like coming full circle as I am now preparing to leave town um, because I've just accepted a call at a church in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, wow. um, so I'm sorry to be leaving the area, but really grateful for God using me in the ways. And so it felt right to be back here again, because this is where I started in Seattle. And y'all just welcomed me and loved me and embraced me. And that experience of church has been unforgettable and really just tattooed on my heart. So I appreciate you. Um, I have what I will call blending privilege, because I hate the term passing. Um, and so... When I hmm. walk into environments, can unless you, can you pause I out for a myself, can you, 
can you pause for a moment and sure. define passing? Uh, well, I'm going to define blending. blending. Okay, yeah, define. Blending yeah, just... means that I can easily blend in with cis normative society. People don't look at me and wonder, hey, was that guy born a little girl? What is going on? You know, and so often trans men have that experience more than trans women. Why? Because sexism. Mm -hmm. Because men can look like anything from uh, Danny DeVito to Arnold Schwarzenegger and nobody ever questions your gender. But if you're a woman or perceived to be a woman, if you're too tall, too short, too hairy, not hairy enough, don't have a bump here, have too much bump there, <laughs> people feel like they can verbally and physically abuse you. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of the trans misogyny is still rooted in misogyny. And Amen. so as you're, if you're a, a cis ally, I want you to remember that the same things that you go through, your trans sisters do too. Step it on up there and, and address it. Because um, body shaming is a thing that affects all bodies. So I say all that to say that my experience in faith is because I out myself. And I out myself because if I don't, my trans kindred will not know how to find me. Amen. They won't know that there's already somebody there that's on their side. And so when, when I'm in the pulpit, I, I want to lift up uh, all the, every time there's unfortunately another trans murder, I keep a count, a running count in my church so they know what I'm going through in between mm -hmm. Sundays. And I want people to know, like I've heard this a million times, I've never met anybody trans. And I'm like, yeah, you have. Yeah, you, have. <laughs> you just didn't know. So let me just help you with that right now. I love it when people tell me that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, the funniest story I ever had, I was doing a presentation at a college, and this guy said to me, you know, nothing personal, but you're not going to make a very attractive woman. And I was like, okay, first, that's very lucas, and second, other way. You're, right. you're going the wrong direction. But I'm doing this whole presentation, and he's listening to me thinking I'm a trans woman that's coming out. I'm like, okay, well, first, that was very validating, but no. Um, <laughs> I, I try to be out at various levels of church activity, national, denominational, because if I don't, A, they don't know that we're already there and doing the work, mm -hmm. B, they don't know that trans men exist, right. C, they don't know that black trans men exist, they don't know that fat trans men exist, they don't know that older trans men exist, they don't know that sober trans men exist. I hold a lot of spots, and so I make them available for people to contact me if they need my assistance. And so it, it's, and which is weird, because I'm not really outgoing, like I'm a fake extrovert, so. You, you fake it well. Well, yeah. it's, it's my job. Yeah. Right, know? I, mean, I understand. I, I'm, I'm like a borderline recluse with an extroverted affect. So <laughs> I, I don't people well, but I feel like and I'm going to tell this very brief story. Early in my transition, there were two black trans men in the U.S. who were out and doing work. Within a year of my beginning transition, they had both suicided. So there was this huge void that I was walking into. I didn't have any special experience. And what, what give us a time frame of this. What year was this? Oh, God, now you're making me do math. 20, how old am I? 61 and then backwards. 23 or four years ago? Okay. Somewhere yeah. in there. Um, and so I just stepped into the void. Um, not because I knew what I was doing or I was especially trained or felt worthy or capable, but because I felt that to honor their memory, some of us needed to step in. And it took about, you know, 20 of us to step in to fill their two sets of shoes. But, you know, it was a, it was a weird roller coaster. Um, because again, I, I don't really like people like that. So <laughs> when people were responding and asking me to do things, I was like, okay, you know. And since then, an entire world, and I'm going to be specific, an entire world of black trans men, activists, creators, business owners, entrepreneurs have developed all around me, all over the world. It is just a fascinating thing. And even though we're kind of in the margins of the margins of the margins in the media and also in some people's consciousness, um, there is a face group, Facebook group that started, I don't know, 10 years ago called Black Trans Men Inc. that has thousands of members from around the world. Wow. 
thousands of members from around the world. And so I'm not alone anymore. They're not alone anymore. And we know what we're capable of because we can see what we're all doing. That translated to me in the United Church of Christ um, in being really out and open. First of all, I'm not good at hiding. I'm like, I'm too slow to run and too big to hide, so you get what you get. I'm not, <laughs> I, you know, closets are not my happy place. And I don't ever want anybody to ambush me with my own story. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I have to say this in a way that I hope makes sense. It's not, being trans has not been the biggest hurdle I faced. Mm -hmm. Being conscious and black has been the biggest hurdle I faced mm -hmm. in the UCC. Because there's this self-congratulatory progressivism that ain't doing nothing. Right. So when I show up and I say, okay, I see your Black Lives Matter sign, what that mean? Right. What you doing with that? Where is that? Who, what black people have you confirmed that with? That's more problematic than my being trans. They're cool with me. Oh, let's rave with pink and blue and rainbows. Let's do all that stuff. But that is not my experience. My experience is not the same as Chaz Bono. Never will be. And so what I need for me is not just acceptance of my transness, but acceptance of my entirety and how it differs and how it's similar to experiences as they manifest in the world and in the church. Amen. Um, yes, so much there. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, I'm, I often find myself aware and, and walking the balance between speaking from a place of marginalization as a trans person and a space of privilege as a white person. And holding those two things in tension is, um, again, tiring, but ever so important in, in this journey and in this process. And, um, you know, what you shared is something that only you could share. And so thank you for being here, for being present in that. The other thing that um, I really want to, to thank you for well, two things. Well, so many things, but two things right now. Um, the uh, part of the reason I love having trans men on these panels is because you said things about the experience of a trans man as opposed to experience of a trans woman that I don't feel as a trans woman, I can say. Um, blending, um, as you put it, or passing. Um, it used to be the goal of the trans community. That used to be the goal. Uh, the target. I mean, when you started, everyone was like, okay, what's the path? How are we going to get to where people don't even know? And as a result, activism for the trans community lagged behind for, for many years because we, the intention was invisibility. And like you said, we, you met trans people without knowing that you met trans people. Um, whereas the gay and lesbian community became more vocal and out. Um, so it's been, it's been challenged over the last 30 years in particular did that same even in the last seven years since I came out there's been a shift toward um, gender non-binary people even that word even that phrase being present and um, you know being more acceptable to in, in younger generations in particular um, the other thing is um, with any marginalization we should never expect people within those margins to be our educators. Um, so again, thank you all for being present and stepping into that space. That being true, um, I also believe that as an articulate, educated trans person, I have a responsibility to be present and speaking and engaging so that others don't have to. Um, and, and I don't often get to hear others reflect that um, in that space. So once again, thank you um, for your presence, for your openness, for your honesty, for going against the grain of your nature as a, I, I won't say it as eloquently as you did, as a, a recluse extrovert or whatever. They know me here. Like okay, <laughs> all right, excellent, good. <laughs> Good. So, all right. Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, some of my interactions with faith communities, uh, I am uh, also a seminary graduate um, and uh, uh, was in 
New Jersey at the time and uh, was an intern at a really fantastic church there, uh, Reformed Church of Highland Park. Um, but that church is, or, or was, uh, a member of the RCA Reformed Church in America, which is, uh, can, can be more of a conservative denomination. But, um, but yeah, I was, I really, I really, I really felt very supported at RCHP, and uh, it was kind of um, close, close to the time that I came out, and they were really wonderful, and uh, yeah, so it's a special place. Um, but I was also uh, in the ordination track there, and um, the my sort of advisor was also really wonderful but because i didn't go to an rca seminary i had to go through this sort of different track and i remember there was a time i was i was sitting at the library at new brunswick theological seminary and waiting to talk to the person who was supposed to like oversee my ordination or whatever um and i was sitting at a table in the library and i watched him walk in and i watched him walk around watched him look around for a long time and i thought okay here we go uh, and he came over and he goes oh wow you must be ara nobody would ever know that you're not actually a woman <laughs> and the the conversation actually managed to go downhill from there <laughs> And uh, when you start at sea level and go downhill, we call that sinking. Right, yeah. Tunneling. Yeah. Tunneling. Um, but I, I remember after that, I was, I was talking to uh, my advisor, the supportive one, and I said, I, I, don't, I don't think I can do this. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'd like to stop the ordination process. And, he was, he was really understanding and uh, was, an, was an older man and cried in the office there with me and that was uh, really kind, kind of touching to me because it was like, it, it felt validating in a way that I hadn't necessarily felt from church men. Um, but yeah, after that, I didn't really go to church for quite a while and uh, started to uh, recover from other things in my past and found that I really needed to rely on, on my faith for that. And uh, yeah, this, this last summer, 2021, I started thinking about going back to a, a church community and I thought well maybe I can find the church in Seattle that seems the most like RCHP <laughs> uh, so that kind of drove drove me here and it's really been a robust welcome <laughs> so far Good. well I'm grateful you found found a place I'm grateful you um, started looking again um, that's a that's a big step for all of us in that process um, so our final question is, what, what are some things that you need or expect or would like to have from faith communities? And, and feel free to approach this as a moment of gratitude for things that you have found and find in faith communities. Feel free to um, put it out there as a invitation um, to, to churches to be more accepting and affirming. Um, and I invite you to not only think about um, Plymouth, because I think we've established that this place is rather awesome. Um, but think about faith communities as a whole um, in America. And just for fun, we're going to go backwards and start with you, Ara, because I'm the moderator and I get to decide that. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so I think uh, one one thing that's important to me in terms of like being at a faith community is to to not f not feel like my gender is being policed because like I'm I'm a whole person. <laughs> uh, I was myself before I came out. I've been myself my whole life, and I think there's I think sometimes there's kind of an unspoken like impetus that 
you can't talk about your past or that like your mm -hmm. life started when you came out and like that's that's not the case and I think like in terms of that there's like in the past because I'm a trans woman and because of that it's felt like I kind of need to try and be more more feminine than I than I really am because like I want people to accept me and respect me but like I I'm I'm just the the person I am and to like accept and respect me as as simple as just like accepting and respecting that. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I talk about is the pendulum swing and we spend so many years over here trying to be who we're expected to be. And it's like this pendulum builds this tension and tension and tension and when we finally release it it swings all the way over here and we fight so hard to be counter to everything that we were expected to be. And it takes time for that pendulum to find its plumb spot and to be who we truly are. And um, it's beautiful to watch it happen and to see people step into that space. Um, the other thing I would like to add um, to that, I'm, I relate to and agree with you that my past is still so very much part of who I am. Um, a lot of trans people will use the term dead name to refer to their old names. I like the term birth name um, because it's, it's not dead to me. It is still part of who I am. I want to encourage you to let us decide where that narrative plays out in our interaction with you. There are trans people who still hold deep traumas tied to their past lives, to their old names. And um, again, narratives are sacred, and they are ours to offer as we are comfortable offering um, them. So thank you, Reverend. Yeah, I don't even know how to answer that question. Hmm. Ari, I think you really hit on something that's important to me that I want from faith communities and communities in general. <sighs> Stop being so conflict avoidant. Hmm. And stop being so gender essentialist. Those are the two things. Like, you know, like even in trans communities that I'm a part of, there is this notion that you're a trans man and therefore you're straight and macho and all these things. And I'm like, yeah, not so much. Not right. so much. We get to have variation too, right? Like we don't get to. But when I came out, it was very rigid. And the communities that came out before me, particularly in black communities, because one of the... One of the things is, we need to be acceptable. And blending was critical because it was the difference between being dead and alive. Amen. And so it wasn't like a choice. It was like, right. I feel butch inside, but let me throw this piece of hair on because I need to go to the market. You know what I mean? It was a, it was a, a thing, and it still is. That's the hard part. It still is. So when we talk about things like even access to hormones and medical transition, if that's a part of your transness, Everybody still doesn't have that. There are still people bootlegging silicone on the streets mm -hmm. and dying from it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the issues that are bigger issues like universal health care, that affects us even more exponentially. And it, it, when you were talking about um, blending and, and, and passing and stuff, it was actually the Harry Benjamin, Harry Benjamin standards that said, you do not tell anybody except your, lawyer, except your doctor. Yes. So in order to get treatment, you had to do what was the opposite of building community. Right. It was only the people that broke the rules that actually allowed us to build community. Right. The people that broke the medical standards that were vaunted around the country and around the world as being the standard. There were people who were uh, trans and same gender loving who could not get treatment because they weren't straight. Right. There have always been people who are gender non-conforming and non-binary throughout all of time. And in later generations, people have given us new language on how to address them because they realized that's not quite right what you're saying there. That's not me. Um, and, and I want to make an admission. My best friend is, is, um, identifies as otherwise. That is their gender identity. And so it was my first kind of like really close relationship with someone who was gender non-conforming and non-binary. And I messed up pronouns all the time. All the time. I thought, oh, wow, now I know how my mom felt. This sucks. 
And, and I just kept going. And, I, and I, sometimes I had to have explanations. Um, the first gay, trans, first gay black trans man I met, who I had known prior to transition, who was a stone butch, I was like, wait, what? How did this, you're, wait, you're with men now? How did, wait, cis men? Like, really? And what he said to me changed my life forever. He said, as a woman, the power dynamic between me and men was unacceptable. Hmm. As a man, I can engage them because we're on equal footing. Wow. That had never occurred to me before. I was like, That's okay, I've just been educated. Yeah. But I think there are ways in which we discuss gender essentialism in the church and outside of the church that diminish all of us. Trans and cis. And so that's the thing I want to do. And I also want to encourage you, if you don't know something, if something rubs you the wrong way, if you have a question, just do it for goodness sake. Don't, like, I have never met so many conflict avoiding and triangulating people as I have since I've been involved with the church. Amen. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, can you just say what you need to say, and then we go ahead and hash it out, and we go have lunch. That's, you know, but we're so afraid, I understand the reasons, we're so afraid of offending someone and hurting someone's feelings that we forget that this veil of acceptance that isn't real acceptance is even more hurtful. Because once we pierce that veil and we realize you didn't accept us at all anyway, and you were just too chicken S to ask the question, yes. then we feel betrayed and we can't trust you anymore. Right. So I beg of you, stop being conflict avoidant and please try to be less gender essentialist. Yeah. As we said this morning, let your yes be yes, your no be no, and let your love be love. Yeah. Um, a couple things that came out that I want to want to give some some definition and clarification to. You mentioned the Benjamin um, uh, standards of care. Um, those have been around since uh, gosh, the late fifties, I think. Um, the W Path, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Um, is kind of the caretaker of the Benjamin standards of care. And as uh, science has grown around gender awareness and gender identity and biological gender, uh, the Benjamin standards of care have evolved. There is constant debate um, as to whether or not they have evolved enough and whether they're keeping up. As academic things, as with all academic things, the wheels turn slowly um, and for good reason. Um, if they turned too fast, they could hurt, they could cause harm. And so the whole point of the standards of care is to, to keep that harm at bay and to keep professionals who are engaging the trans community on a regular basis. And this includes um, academics, it includes medical, mental health care professionals, pastors. As a seminary student, um, I became a student member and now as a pastor, I am a, a full-fledged member of W Path um, in terms of spiritual care, um, so the, that was is what and was being referenced um, there with the standards of care. So um, again, thank you for um, for all of that, Michelle. Um, what I need more than anything from my faith communities is affirmation that I am actually fully human. Mm -hmm. that I'm worthy of God's grace and valued as a fully participating member of the faith community. Uh, I really do wish for more than just mere toleration. Mm -hmm. I wish to be seen and to be able to contribute whatever I can yes, yes. to the life of the community. And uh, obviously I have found that here at Plymouth over the years. And I'm very grateful that I've finally been able to find it in my home church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, that's a work in progress. Uh, the Green Lake Church uh, is unique in Seattle, and it's almost unique in the entire denomination. There's probably three, maybe, Adventist churches where I would be safe in the entire country. So we have a lot of work to to do in, 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 in my home denomination. And um, I, I don't broadcast myself as trans. It's not something, it's not a label I carry, you know, on a shoulder patch or anything like that. But I am very visible. And if people know I'm trans, I'm okay with that. 
for reasons that have been mentioned here previously, to demonstrate to other Adventist young people that it's okay and it's possible. Thank you. I, I am very moved and very touched to hear that coming from an Adventist church. And like you say, there's a lot of work to be done there. And there is a strong movement of good, healthy people um, that, are, that are taking on that challenge. And your story will inspire them as, it, um, as you are able to tell it. So. Um, taking sort of the advice of my choir teacher, Josh Files, seeing, the gr- seeing something great seeing something we're already doing good at and improving it is all too often I see that um, LGBTQ people as a whole often get treated like a rarity because what was the statistic back when I was in middle school? Like 3% of the U.S. um, falls into the category of gay. They identify as gay. And often what I find is that leads to a scenario in which, oh, if we can't see them, we don't need to worry about them. And so people will only worry about us when, we're ta- when they're talking about LGBTQ issues as a whole, and often that leads to us not getting the um, help and support that we truly and desperately need. So just like generally in the community and in faith communities, just realizing and recognizing that there are so many more people on that spectrum of queerness than initially meets the eye. It's like, if we're only the 1%, then how come when I go to my high school, 50% of the people I meet there are identifying as gay or bisexual or queer or trans, and even more that are closeted and will barely admit to it. Right. We just need to do better at recognizing that we are not so rare in the world and that there's more of us than you really think there are. Amen. Amen. Well said. Very well said. Um, you use the term queer, and speaking as someone who is, I'm going to be generous and say only twice your age, it's probably more than that, but um, <laughs> I grew up, do I have a cane somewhere here? I can, <laughs> um, it, for us growing up, um, you, y'all can back me up on this, queer was not a word that we wanted to talk to, and I'm sure a lot of you... Um, remember those those days and so whenever whenever we're in a context like this I want to go out of my way to say queer is good <laughs> um, as a community now and even me personally uh, we like the word queer it means other than um, it means outside of the normative <laughs> and um, uh, Remember back when they called a stick shift a standard shift? Yes. You remember when it was no longer standard? No. Yeah, I mean, it, it, became, it became the exception. Right. Automatic became standard. Right. You know, and what you just described was where queerness is no longer, it isn't as much the othered. There's so much other that queerness is becoming, quote, normative. Now, if we're talking about the music scene, that's when alternative music would become mainstream and all the people who liked it would leave it because they like it because it's alternative. But there's a, there's a progressive shift that we have where words like queer... Um, I even heard some kids use the term fagging the other day, and I cringed. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're, we like it. We're embracing it. And so keeping up and understanding the language and, um, you know, now it's, it's also one of those things where they, they can talk about themselves that way, but for a cis straight person to use those words, it's, it's challenging. So, um, so thank you for using the word queerness so that I could have that little moment. And, be careful, though, because some people are still going to punch you in the face if you say that. Right. Because uh, everybody isn't reclaiming it. So right. Just keep in mind that yeah. it's somewhat generational, but it's also regional. It is. It's so. regional. And, and mostly I want to invite you, when you hear that from other people, that it's not always the derogatory term right. that, that we want to refer with that. So we have about 10 minutes in the slotted time um, that we have, and I do want to uh, open the floor 
to questions. Um, Jen has a mic there if anyone has. Any thoughts, any questions? Oh, I've got one hand over there. And Here we go. Yeah. They know everything. They know the Seriously, yeah. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me? Speak up. Okay. Speak up, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask if there was like a gift that your trans identity gave to your faith or some sort of deepening, just any opening that you felt um, that you might want to talk about. I didn't hear much of any of that. So, uh, well, let me re repeat it. Is there a gift that being trans has brought to our lives that to our faith specifically um, so for me personally understanding God as non-binary um, understanding that to be created in the image of God is into to be created either male or female um, that as an intersex person um, it does it, it not only does it not diminish me being created in the image of God it gives me the opportunity to step outside of a boundary that we often put at, put on God as we anthropomorphize God in order to in order to understand us being made in the image of God we have to create God in the image of us and so being a trans person has pushed me outside of some confines of ex most human experience so that I can see God in God's image more closely, not that I truly see God in God's image. God is still and always will be a mystery to me, but I think that is, that's one thing that being trans has pushed me on my faith. Anyone else want to? Even though I'm I mean, an answer, so I'm going to wait for y'all. <laughs> I think um, one definite thing for me is like uh, I'm also uh, pretty introverted and I think like in the past have had a definite tendency to try and just like live in my mind and I think like one of the things that being trans has offered to my to my own faith is like just having to contend with the fact that I have a body and like, yeah. and, and like t to realize it's good and I, I need to take care of it. That's Amen. That's yeah, that's good. So being me, who's also a trans person, because it's not just being trans, I, that's not the entirety of it, has allowed me to live in and offer an intersectional and kaleidoscopic vision of divine. The divine is not either or, it's not both, it's all, it's all, it's beyond our understanding. And so since I have at times in my life been beyond my own understanding, uh, and certainly beyond the understanding of the people that I've been in community with, it allows me to live in that, and it's not it's not like a rainbow, I assure you. Sometimes it's murky mm -hmm. in this intersectional life. Sometimes I'm celebrating one thing and punching throats in my mind <laughs> because all of who I am is always where I am. It's not, I can't slice pieces <clears throat> off because it's gay pride or it's Black History Month or it's whatever. There are ways in which the 39 years that I lived being identified as a girl and a woman will always be with me and will always inform the man that I am. Mm. Thank God. Amen. Yeah. Thank God for yep, that. Yep, yep. And so I can't not live in that. That's really the gift. Reminds me of somebody told me that unicorns have horns, but so does a rhinoceros. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. My biological father was both physically and emotionally abusive. And so it was impossible for me to relate to God our Father. Mm. And so I struggled for much of my life on how to relate to God, how, how to find a metaphor for God that, 
was safe and worked for me. And it was only after I recognized myself as trans and transitioned that my, my sense of God broadened, that in fact God is probably genderless and probably embodies the feminine as much as, much as the masculine. And so that allowed me to think of God using the metaphor of mother. Now it turns out that didn't, wasn't a perfect metaphor either because my mother um, was a terribly disturbed individual. But I still, it was still something I could connect to, this, the sense of the divine feminine. And uh, that's been very, very important to me in terms of me uh, connecting with the idea of God. Um, I don't as much have an answer for faith specifically because I am a bit agnostic, but when I came out um, as trans, I slowly started to realize that um, I feel like at some point in our lives, we sort of, it's sort of the beauty of humans that we sort of have to invent ourselves. Like whether we identify as the gender that we were born as or whether we identify as something new, it's all sort of this like, amorphous blob inside ourselves that we sort of have to invent and figure out as we go. And that's just something I find really beautiful about life in general. Yeah. Let me just take a second and affirm and thank you for coming to a church and to a faith community from an agnostic place and make sure that you hear that your voice is valuable here and appreciate it. Any other questions? Comments? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't have a question. Okay. But I just want to say, um, on behalf of um, Plymouth Church, that what's happening in this space today, by way of worship, but also here, is something so important that we don't need to pull out um, or, or extrapolate from what we're doing as a church. We are making space, not safe space, because we can't guarantee that. Mm. But we're making courageous space. And also, we are doing something that um, redefines leadership. Because when Jennifer, uh, Reverend Jennifer Castle was so ably coming up with today, we made the decision to center your voices without trying to put the traditional voices on tap as if we needed to justify mm -hmm. and make space for you. So I am super delighted and grateful that not only do you help me to make sense of the Genesis text <laughs> where it says that the spirit hovered over this mysterious, chaotic nothingness and create it because the, cor the courage for you to stand up, for you to put on clothes, for you to head here and to be in this space, knowing that this is a, we have flags flying, but also we are a challenged and challenging place mm -hmm. where we're trying to truly figure out what it means to not only have you here on Trans Awareness Sunday, but also have you on staff also have you on council, have you in leadership roles, and also teaching us how to be fit for you. Amen. <laughs> and so I am super grateful, but also feel more of a, more like a faithful person because I have witnessed what I witnessed today. Amen. And so I just, <laughs> I am grateful and want to, to walk alongside each of you as we discover how to um, um, faithfully support you in the work that you will be doing, how to support, how to understand and know, as you uh, raised Reverend Lewis Mitchell, uh, about the fact that we may want to be interested in healthcare a little bit. We may want to be interested in opening a credit union. Yeah. Because what I know is that trans and non-binary people often end up at Walmart as their bank. Right. 
rather than going to chase in other places. And it is important for us to understand these things. If you want to know the cycle of, of wealth, we need to know about Western Union mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of these other things. Because I'm telling you, my cash app is active because I would rather send my trans or non-binary friend something through cash app than them having to try to figure out where to go cash a check or all these other things. Right. Right. And so there's really something in us that has to understand this is not just about what we believe or the fantastic liturgy that was um, brought forth today, mm -hmm. but this is really about finding ways for thriving for people who are trans and non-binary. And Amen. as your Amen. senior pastor, I am promising that we will participate in those ways. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I, uh... Man, I miss you already. <laughs> I'm going to come see you in Tucson. So, uh, I uh, thank you for that. And one of, part of my project, part of um, what I, I talked about earlier, the Coalition for Peace and Reconciliation, the, the headquarters of that is going to be mobile. Um, I'm looking for a, a, a light, small travel trailer that I can, will convert into a studio. And I'm calling the studio the Amplifier. And the point of the amplifier is that I'm not going to go around and give people a voice. I'm going to go around and make the voice they already have louder. And what I have felt today is the voice that I have being amplified in this space. It helps that it echoes in here beautifully, and it's <laughs> a great room to be amplified in. But, um, but thank you for that experience, and thank you all for bringing your voices here. And yeah. If you would like to support uh, one organization doing this work, I am the co-founder of Trans Faith, and we are always looking for support, specifically financially, because most of our grants got cut because we don't have a location that provides HIV services. Like, that's really what they're giving trans people money for. Hmm. Uh, people doing spiritual work, they ain't giving us no money. So if you want to make a contribution, just look up Trans Faith, www.transfaith.info. You'll find us. Spread the word. Please contribute. We would love to have your support. Yep. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody, for staying. It's been a very powerful morning. Um, so, uh, Reverend Norbeth, would you like to pray us out? I would love to. Thank okay. you. Holy God, Creator, Mother, Father, we thank you. We thank you that our voices are heard. We thank you that our voices carry. We thank you that our voices are empowered and lifted up by your very spirit, alive, working, loving through and in us. We thank you for this congregation, for their pastors, for their history for the narrative that has driven them to this point of this moment of this day where our voices matter. We pray for them as they continue to contemplate what it means to matter, what it means for us as trans people, for our LGBTQ siblings, for people of color in the community, for immigrants, for the homeless, for the hurting. We pray that loving comes to show us what truly matters to be among us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your example. And go with us as we seek to love as we are loved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Mm-hmm. <laughs>